Father, we just thank you today and this glorious day. Thank you for drawing us together on your Shabbat. And we rest in Messiah. We rest in the truth of the gospel, the truth of Messiah's death, burial, and resurrection for our, our redemption to save us from our sins, Lord. And we just thank you for the wonderful and rich and beautiful uh, truths in the story as we open up today, Lord, to continue to read in John chapter 11. We ask you to open our hearts and our minds, lead us and guide us, Lord. Help us to grasp the deeper things. Help us to see things we haven't seen before and draw us closer to you, Lord, as we wait for your coming, for your return. Shem Yeshua, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So last yeah. week, we were looking at some prophetic happenings in our world. We were looking at signs in the heavens, the timing of spring, uh, the new year, the month of Nisan this past week. And things continue to change and ramp up according uh, to the things in, in the world, the economy, uh, the state of Israel. A lot of things are happening. We're seeing a shift in their policies that are pretty radical that we haven't seen for a long, long time. And uh, they are no longer trying to appease the UN. Uh, one government official, which was so shocking, finally came out and called out the Palestinian myth. There is no Palestinian people. And usually it's like one of those protected, um, you know, uh, statements like, you know, uh, being politically correct. You don't say that even though everybody knows it. And uh, they are also taking back some of their land, which is crazy that they're doing this now. And much is happening all around the world. Crazy things like the rumors of war with Haiti, of all places. That just is so ridiculous to me. It, it, what it brought to mind was, I don't know if you've ever seen it. It was a John Candy movie. It was a comedy called Canadian Bacon. And the, the U.S. went to war with Canada and they portrayed Canada as all these really nice people that, you know, <laughs> were too nice to go to war with. So, I mean, it's just like a ridiculous notion. And, um, you know, we began to see and understand Yahweh's timing is not our timing. So in the 11th chapter of John, we see that Yeshua purposefully delayed after hearing Lazarus was sick until after he died. Then Yeshua went to Bethany. So that's where we pick up today in uh, John 11 at verse 17. Okay. So when Jesus came, he found that he had been in the tomb for four days already. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So according to Judaism, a Shemira are formed, a, it's a uh, type of guard. And it's to prevent desecration of the body prior to the burial. So literally, they are literal bodyguards. Shemira is practiced out of respect for the dead and that they should not be abandoned prior to their arrival in their new home in the ground. This serves as a comfort for the surviving loved ones as well. So the burial will have taken place as soon as possible and generally within a day or two. They believe the soul hovers over the body for three to seven days prior to the time of Shiva, which is the morning after the death. So Shiva starts the, the day after the burial. So the human soul is somewhat lost and confused between death and before burial, and it stays in the general vicinity of the body until the body is interned. This is what was believed. Uh, the Shomrim, which is the plural for Shemira, sit and read aloud, comforting psalms during that time that they are watching over the body. This serves as a comfort for both the spirit of the departed who is in transition, but is also a comfort for the family. Traditionally, Shomrim read psalms or the book of Job. Shomrim are also encouraged to meditate, pray, and read spiritual texts or text about death. Trying to reconstruct the timing, 
uh, when we look at Yeshua coming to Bethany, the messenger would have come to him uh, and that trip would have taken about two days to get to Yeshua with the news about the sickness. He then waited two more days until he was dead. And then it would have taken roughly two more days to travel. So four days. So when the messenger got there, if Yeshua had left right then, he might have gotten there in time. So imagine how the sisters felt knowing that Yeshua delayed in spite of their dire message. Verse 20. Then Martha heard that Jesus was coming and she went and met him, but Mary stayed in the house. So Martha is broken. She's unable to grasp why Yeshua didn't come but she goes out to him. Mary stayed in the house, despondent, consumed with grief, not just because of her dead brother, but because of disillusionment. No matter how close she thought they were, Yeshua disappointed them. There was no way to fathom this seeming disregard for their needs and suffering. Verse 21. Therefore, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, he will give you. So Martha's upset and she doesn't hesitate to lay her disappointment upon the Lord. But in the very next breath, faith breaks forth. Even now, it's virtually impossible to change this situation now. But even now, Lord, as we've been reading about Abraham, and the words of the Lord to Sarah is anything too hard for Yahweh. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will still live even if he dies. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? So he said, he who believes in me will still live, even if he dies. Yeshua taught us in Matthew twenty-two thirty-one. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, haven't you read what was spoken to you by God saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So the idea that the dead are uh, fully dead runs counter to what Yeshua taught. Why sit vigil with a body if the soul is dead and gone, but a part of us lives as they believed? Continuing to stay near the body, aware of the people reading the Psalms for their sake, don't know if that's true at this point. But I, uh, I do know that the scripture says to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. Yeshua said, I am the God of, not I was the God of. He is the one who goes on with relationship beyond the death of the body. So Yeshua told a parable, coincidentally, uh, about a man named Lazarus. That name does not show up in the New Covenant anywhere else except here in John and in Luke in this parable. And nothing is random in Scripture. Luke 16, 19. There was a certain rich man, and he was clothed in purple and fine linen, living in luxury every day. A certain beggar named Lazarus was taken to his gate full of sores, desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Yes, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The beggar died, and he was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus at his bosom. So one of the first things I want to point out is that generally when the Lord spoke a parable, the characters were nameless. But in this time, 
The main character is named Lazarus. You notice even the rich man doesn't have a name. Mm -hmm. The name only shows up here in the parable and in John. And we are introduced to the man who is the brother of Mary and Martha. So we've talked much about the relationship between Mary, Martha, Simon the Pharisee, who is also called Simon the Zealot and Simon the Leper. He is called the father of Judas. This is Judas the betrayer. This is a family in Bethany, and this is where their family estate is. It's in the, the uh, region of, of Benjamin. Simon is wealthy. He is hyper-religious. He is zealous for the law. He is uh, one of these uh, zealots that sit in judgment of all who do not keep the Torah as he sees fit. He's called Simon the leper, not because he has leprosy or he wouldn't be among the people, but perhaps he was one of the 10 who Jesus healed on the road that day. So if so, then he had experienced the power of God to heal. But if Lazarus is a brother, why is he never mentioned until now? So could Simon be the rich man in the parable? Luke 16, 24. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in the same way, bad things. But here he is now comforted and you are in anguish. Besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed or a chasm that those who want to pass from here to you are not able and that no one may cross over from there to us. So, you know, this is, don't miss this point. Here is this man who had all these bad things happen to him in life, but in death, he was comforted. God comforted him. So the guy who had everything go right for him, where did he end up, right? And I always think that that has to do with the fact that people that are perishing, God gives them a little bit of pleasure here in this world because they aren't going to have anything good after this. So there is regret after death. We can see that from this rich man. Uh, he is one who did not find righteousness. And when we sit in judgment of others, and I mean judging them, whether they are worthy of punishment of death, this is not about discernment. You know, it's not a judge not, you know, we're supposed to judge with righteous judgment. But we must be discerning, especially today, because, you know, they want us to respect and celebrate everyone, even those who are wicked. And we do have a right to decide if someone, uh, you know, is walking in righteousness in the church. But do we have a right to decide if someone should be forgiven by God? We do not. But the zealots, they sat as judge and jury. And they were eager to punish transgressors. So Simon is the rich man. Then this overly religious judge of his brothers ended up in the wrong place. Judgment on our part can result in a dead heart with no compassion and no mercy. And that is not the way. Our father is rich in mercy and compassion. James 2.13, her judgment is without mercy to him who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Luke 16.27, he said, I ask you, therefore, Father, that you would send him, Lazarus, to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them so they won't also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. He said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, 
Neither will they be persuaded if one rises from the dead. So, you know, people call on Jesus, and I've seen this happen more times than I care to. Something is bad in their life. Something is going on. And suddenly they get religion, right? They start calling on Jesus. They start praying, you know, up a storm. But they will not open the Bible. They will not listen to preaching. They don't want to know him. They don't want to know his word. But they want him to come and help them. They want signs and wonders. They want miracles. But if they don't believe God's word, then they're not going to believe even if someone is raised from the dead. So since they know the law and they do not do or heed the law, then even a great miracle like a resurrection from the dead will not convince them. Gee, does that sound familiar? Yeah. Even Jesus, when he was raised from the dead, they still did not believe him. Simon is a Pharisee, like Paul. Paul knew the law and the prophets backwards and forwards. He was flawless in keeping it. But he is not heeding the warnings of Torah, nor has he understood the heart of God. Lazarus died and went to Sheol, the abode of the dead, but to the pleasant place called the bosom of Abraham, a place where those who had been counted righteous by God went to wait for the coming of Mashiach. Were they dead? No. To be dead is lifeless, no consciousness. But according to the parable, there was much conversation. No. You can't have a conversation with a dead thing. The soul and the spirit live on. Mm -hmm. Now also in the parable was the rich man who did not, I'm sorry, who God did not count as righteous. He died, but was not in Abraham's bosom, but was in the place of flame and torment. He too was conscious because the soul and the spirit of the person are eternal. Mm -hmm. That is why it is so very important never to neglect our eternal destiny, because you will be somewhere no. very conscious. It will be either wonderful or beyond terrible. So whoever lives and believes in Messiah is saved right now in life, and he will never die. You will, as Paul wrote, uh, be absent from the body and at home with the Lord. You will go on until you are reunited with a, an immortal body. And the question is, do you believe this? You know, like the pastor said this morning, um, you know, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants yeah. to die, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to take care of that in-between place. We have to take care of uh, basically like, you know, the world would say our ticket to heaven. We have to make sure we have that, you know, punched and ready to go. So did Simon, the rich man, believe in Yeshua? Well, the scripture tells us that he did not. He did not have faith. And at least uh, not until the end. So what about Lazarus? He's poor, wretched, naked. Sounds like Yeshua's words to the lukewarm church in Laodicea. Mm -hmm. So how does Lazarus end up being counted righteous? Well, the name Lazarus means Yah has helped. So I suggest that the parable was told so that Simon the Pharisee, who is Simon the Zealot, could also decide whether he would die as the rich man or become Lazarus. I believe that the rich man and Lazarus are one man with two different paths. He could humble himself and understand his wretched state, his spiritual poverty before God and believe Yeshua and be saved. Or despite that truth, and refuse to acknowledge his weakness and continue in his own strength and self-righteousness and die as the rich man. Lazarus, who died, is Simon. And John gives us that clue by using the epithet, Yah has helped to connect us to the parable. So I believe that, you know, he's writing about Lazarus, but Lazarus is the nickname of Simon. John eleven twenty seven. 27. 
She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, God's son who has come into the world. So she's saying, I trust. I have been fully persuaded that you are the one that we have awaited. More than a mere man, more than a prophet like Moses, you are the very son of God, the source of everything. Even now, you can ask God and he will do whatever you ask. Mm -hmm. Martha is a beautiful example of the scripture that we must all live by, that we should not grieve like the rest of the world who have no hope. Martha's hope was in the one who was speaking to her. Verse 28. When she had said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, the teacher is here and is calling you. When she heard this, she arose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was in the place where Martha had met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and were consoling her when they saw Mary, that she rose up quickly and went out. They followed her saying, she is going to the tomb to weep there. Therefore, when Mary came to Jesus where he was and saw him, she fell down at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Unfortunately with Mary, there is no follow-up statement like Martha, but even now, Lord, she is just brokenhearted and her words partially echo her sister, Martha. If you had been here, my brother would not have died, but her heart may be crying out, why? Mary's heart is still his, for she falls at his feet. She is still humble before him, even in her grief. This is Mary's place. This is the position where she is found, sitting at his feet while he is teaching, at his feet in grief, at his feet on the cross, and at his feet at the empty tomb. She loves him. She cannot fathom what feels like a lack of love coming from the Lord. So we've all been there at some point where we have to wonder, you know, why did God allow this to happen in our life? Why did he let me go through all this terrible, whatever it is, whether it's a broken marriage, whether it's sickness or loss. Sometimes we wonder if God loves us, but no matter how many times the word of God describes God's perfect character when things go badly in life, we don't always remember that he is good and just and that he is working everything together for our good. Mm -hmm. So in our human frailty, we use faulty logic and we assume that he doesn't love us as he loves others. Mm -hmm. Many of us will regret those thoughts and feelings on the other side of the veil when we finally understand why he allowed the events in our life that caused us pain. Did Yeshua let Lazarus die and the women grieved and broken just to demonstrate his power so that he could have glory and honor? It was necessary for all, for everyone to know that he is the resurrection and the life. He is our source of eternal life and the last day depends on him. It is his voice that the dead will hearken to and be raised. But he was also helping the family in so many ways that they did not even realize. John 5, 24. Most certainly I tell you that he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Most certainly, I tell you, the hour comes and now is when the dead will hear the Son of God's voice and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave the Son also to have life in himself. Don't marvel at this, for the hour comes in which all that are in the tombs will hear his voice. They will come out 
those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Simon was in the midst of the disciples. He was called by Yeshua, but so was his son Judas, a member of the Sicarii, a member of the assassins that were used by the zealots to carry out justice. If Simon continued on this path, he would be raised on the last day in judgment. So remember, Yeshua, it says that Yeshua loved this family. He loved Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. <laughs> John eleven thirty three. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews weeping who came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They told him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. So we can speculate about why Yeshua wept. On the one hand, Mary and Martha both came to him, placing blame on him for the death of their brother because of his delayed coming. Once Yeshua's brothers were urging him to go up to the feast, and he replied, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. Yeshua knew he was about to raise him from the dead. And this plan was important to the overall mission. But the women did not understand, but they should have trusted him. Martha hoped and Mary was hurt. Their response may have hurt the Lord and caused him pain enough to cause him to weep because he loved them. But even more than their unbelief or doubt or disillusionment, which he understood, there was something more that broke his heart, and that was death itself. Hebrews 2.14 Since then the children have partaken of flesh and blood. He also himself likewise partook of the same, <clears throat> that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. <clears throat> Romans 5.21 Sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 25 and 26. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. So John eight fifty one. Most certainly I tell you, if a person keeps my word, he will never see death. So it's not talking about physical death, but spiritual death. We are all appointed once to die. We are conceived in sin, born in a sin nature. We are born spiritually dead. This is the death we are appointed to. But if we believe in and trust the son of the living God, Yeshua, our Messiah, we will never see the second death. The second death is a choice. It has no power over those who have followed Yeshua, who have believed in him. That is what separates us eternally from God, is that second death. 2 Timothy 1.10 tells us that the good news of grace has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the good news. So death is the last enemy, and Yeshua was set to conquer it. John eleven thirty six. The Jews therefore said, see how much affection he had for him. Some of them said, couldn't this man who opened the eyes of him who was blind have also kept this man from dying? So people's hearts are fickle. They're easily turned away when things don't go their way or the way they want. Perhaps divine delays are meant to reveal our own weaknesses and unbelief. 
So John eleven thirty eight, <laughs> Jesus therefore again groaning in himself came to the tomb. Now it was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, "Take away the stone." Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, "Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he has been dead four days." Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see God's glory? So we must pay attention to these lessons when all hope is gone, like the raising of Jairus or Yair's daughter. Don't be afraid, just believe. So it's vital that we get this because bad days are coming. And if we don't settle this issue uh, that we have with timing, we will have a hard time if he doesn't come when we think he should. So learn that lesson today because we need to pray for grace to grasp it. John eleven forty one. So they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you listen to me. I know that you always listen to me. But because of the multitude standing around, I said this that they may believe that you sent me. So was it important for them to see Yeshua do this? Emphatically, yes. Because if they did not believe in him, then they would never understand that he is the resurrection and the life, that he was the only one that could save them. Verse 43. When he said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And he who was dead came out, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. And Yeshua said to them, free him and let him go. So this man was dead and is now physically alive, but he is not yet saved. And, you know, we might consider that his name is Yah has helped. You know, he didn't want him to perish. He didn't want him uh, to go that way. And so perhaps this very dramatic lesson was to save him. He said to him, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they pers be persuaded if one rises from the dead. This is uh, how the parable is going to come to bear and the life of Simon. If Simon missed the spirit of the law and he only clung to the letter of the law, which Paul says the letter kills, then he would not be changed, not even through his own resurrection, at least not yet. John eleven forty five. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. The chief priests, therefore, and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What are we doing? For this man does many signs. And if we leave him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away our place and our nation. So they don't care that he had just done the impossible, something that only Yahweh could do. He didn't just raise him up like, remember the story in the prophets, and I don't remember if it was, I think it was Elisha. Uh, the prophet's bones were in the cave and a man had been killed and they threw his body into the uh, cave. And when his body touched the bones of the prophet, he sprung back to life. Well, that's pretty, pretty great, but he would, he had just died. Lazarus was dead for four days and decay had already set in. So not only did Yeshua raise him from the dead, long dead, but his flesh was restored. His body was restored. No one can do that except Yahweh. And all these leaders, all these Pharisees, all they cared about was their power. This reminds me of the kind of mindset we see today regarding President Trump. They hate the man 
And so they have to find a crime to charge him with because they hate him. That's backward. That's not how our nation was set up. And that's happening also with Prime Minister Netanyahu. They're still trying to take him down. They're trying to find something on him to take him out politically. So that kind of thing makes it unsafe for all of us. Because if they decide that they don't like Christians, then they'll just have to make up charges to remove the problem. So if they just make a law that outlaws us, then that's what they'll do. It's backward. So these religious leaders were politicians. Their lives were not about God. They were hypocrites. Even Yeshua and John the Baptist said so. John 11.49 But a certain one of them, Caiaphas, being the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is advantageous for us that one man should die for the people and, and that the whole nation the whole nation not perish. Now he didn't say this of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only, but that he might also gather together in one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day forward, they took counsel that they might put him to death. Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but departed from them into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim, and he stayed there with his disciples. So this, of course, is prophetic. Because of the rejection of the religious Jews, he left there and went to Ephraim. Ephraim is to become the prophetic name of Yahweh's community of believers under the new covenant. Ephraim would become the fullness of the Gentiles or the fullness of the nations. 55. Now that Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many people went up from the country to Jerusalem before Passover to purify themselves. Then they sought for Jesus and spoke one to another as they stood in the temple. What do you think? That he isn't coming to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had commanded that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it that he might be seized. So John chapter 11 took place in the exact time frame that we are in this week. It is the spring equinox is when the day and the night are of equal length. Yeshua had said to them that there are 12 hours in the day, and he was talking about this season. Passover is less than two weeks away. Yeshua's time of his own death was nearing. He demonstrated to all that he had the authority to give life. But what he had been teaching was not a life where you would die again. But Lazarus would die again. But Yeshua was teaching about eternal life where you will never die. We are waiting for our Lord to come and we hope that none of us will leave this life before he comes. Today, we buried our brother Chuck and uh, we have all lost friends and family in the recent past. But we must not lose hope. Tough times are on the horizon. The sound of war and the rumors of wars is banging louder and louder in the world. We have been warned by the Lord about the coming economic calamity over a year ago, and it appears that it is now at our door. This week, I learned that the Knesset repealed the legislation that ordered the evacuation of four northern West Bank settlements in Samaria in 2005. This was shocking to see. This got my attention because in 2019, the Lord had given me a series of words, Heartland, Equestrian Connection, Fall Grand Finale, and Annexed. At first, I knew all these words that had come from the popular Canadian TV show called Heartland. But as I began to pray and research, I also learned that it pertained to Israel. 
Shortly after President Trump uh, began uh, working on the peace deal between Israel and the Palestinians called Peace Through Prosperity. Of course, the Palestinian Authority hated it because the West Bank, which is Israel's heartland, would come back under the authority of Israel. But according to the treaty, it was supposed to be a win-win for everybody economically. Prime Minister Netanyahu, of course, loved this plan. It would mean that the land reverted back to its God-given inheritance. But in June of 2020, the Lord spoke Saudi Sally to me, and Jared Kushner, less than a month later, began working on a, a negotiation with the Arabs, uh, with the Saudis, to do something different than President Trump's plan. And President Trump's plan got shelved. And so um, all of this changed really fast, almost like overnight. And the peace plan was off the table and a new agreement called the Abraham Accords was now uh, effective. And one of the agreements, uh, one of the points to uh, the agreement was that there would be no annexation of the West Bank. So this was signed in September of uh, September 15th of 2020 with the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. And that same day, Hurricane Sally made landfall, uh, Saudi Sally. So we come back to the original plan of taking back the land, even without President Trump involved. Suddenly, out of nowhere, the Knesset is emboldened and they have done it. So the words I received, Heartland, the West Bank, Samaria, uh, that is what they are taking back. Equestrian connection. I believe this re uh, refers to this, uh, not the seals of Revelation 6, uh, because the first four have already been opened. But it's talking about... Um, what I was sharing last week about Zechariah chapter one, the man on the red horse with the other horses that were behind him, uh, surrounded by the myrtle trees. The red horse is war. And so the fall grand finale is the fall of the West, which includes Israel and could be part of a catalyst for war. So, you know, we're supposed to be their ally which I don't think we will be in this case. But uh, what they're doing is provoking the bear. They're provoking, they're poking everybody in the eye because the whole world hates what they're doing. So if they annex the land, uh, they are talking about also reclaiming Gaza. That's a big deal. So keep your eyes on Israel because it must be the Lord who has emboldened them and we pray that he will defend them because they're doing his will. They're taking the land back. They were never supposed to give it up in the first place. You know, the prime minister that gave it up, gave up his life. You know, God put him in a coma for like 12 years and then he died. He never recovered. So uh, God wasn't happy with that giving over the land to the Palestinians. Zechariah chapter 1, 12. And the angel of Adonai answered and said, Adonai Zebaot, how long will you withhold compassion on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah with whom you've been angry for 70 years? Adonai answered the angel who was speaking with me with pleasant and comforting words. Then the angel speaking to me said, cry out saying, thus says Adonai Zebaot, I'm exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion. I am infuriated with the haughty nations. I was a little angry with them, but they furthered their own calamity. So could this indicate some kind of retaliation uh, by the UN or perhaps their Arab neighbors, even Syria with Russian proxies or Iran? Verse 16, therefore thus says Adonai, I will return to Jerusalem with compassion my house will be built there, declares Adonai Zebaot, and a measuring line will be stretched out over Jerusalem. Again, cry out, thus says Adonai Zebaot, my cities will again overflow with prosperity and Adonai will again comfort Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. 
So God is ready to defend them. He's ready to come and take their part because they finally are doing what's right. So this brings me to the uh, this brings us to the same time of Revelation chapter 11 where John is also given a measuring rod to measure the temple of God and Ezekiel 40 to 43 also they are measuring or assessing Yahweh's holy house but what does he find and uh, Ezekiel he tells us he finds defilement prostitution and all sorts of vile things what is taking place in Israel is the clue that the church is being assessed by the Lord for judgment because judgment comes first to the house of God. So it's our window of salvation, saints. We're almost there. So I want to close with this word of encouragement that was given by the Lord to me at the beginning of the pandemic, March 13th of 2020. Tell everyone to get ready. Not fear, no final farewells. You will all meet up at my house. Yahweh has a few last details to wrap up on earth. It won't be long now. In fact, I come quickly. Be ready to go. No looking back. That's a reference to Lot's wife. Be at peace. I am in control. Nothing happens that I don't approve or allow. So our Lord God and King is never early, but he is never late. We just need to sync with his timing, and everything is going to turn out just fine. (laughs) Hold fast to what you have. The King is coming. Don't lose your crown. Shalom, shalom.